Uh, my name is Clifton Griffin. I'm Dean of Grad Studies and Research here at Salisbury University. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for your attendance uh, and what is a very important topic uh, for people in our local business community, entrepreneurs, people who think they might have something that they might want to take care of or they know they have something that they want to be sure that they protect. Um, this is a great partnership between Salisbury University, TEDCO, which of course is a Maryland Technology Development Corporation, and a new partnership uh, with uh, Salisbury University and Maryland Intellectual Property Legal Resource Center. Our primary speaker is going to be Dr. Patricia Campbell from that entity. Uh, so I want to turn the microphone over quickly uh, to Neil Harris, who is with, uh, Neil Davis, excuse me, Neil, uh, who is with TEDCO, Director of Entrepreneurial Development. Sorry about that. Uh, clearly, I need a little legal advice myself to get names right. Um, and Neil is the Director of Entrepreneurial, that's quite a big word for a Southern boy, Entrepreneurial Development. And so we appreciate the partnership with TEDCO. Uh, we have uh, some faculty members that have been uh, a part of uh, research experiences with TEDCO. It's been a great partnership and collaboration. So Neil, if you're all ready. So thank you, Walter. I appreciate that. Introduction. Sure. <laughs> so I've got about five minutes or two minutes to do three things, which I'll, I'll try and go through really quickly. I'm Neil Davis with, with TEDCO. TEDCO is a, is a great resource in the state of Maryland. We do four things really well. We provide research grant funding to trans, translational researchers at the state universities and federal labs. We provide early stage seed investing and venture investing to exciting startups. We provide a really unique suite of assistive resources to the state's entrepreneurs who've been funded by TEDCO. And lastly, and why we're here today, is that we have a general uh, element of our mission from the state which says we're supposed to get out there and help stimulate the state's innovation economy. So we do things like this. We do things like our Big Entrepreneur Expo every November and a whole lot of trainings and workshops and interactions. That's what TEDCO is all about. Now back in July, we were over here and we did what we called a Rural Business Initiative Listening Session. We had about 35 or 40 people in a room and we asked them a bunch of open-ended questions about how TEDCO could do a better job servicing the entrepreneur on the Lower Eastern Shore. And the very first hand to go up was um, Dean Olmsted, And she said, we don't know anything about intellectual property. Our entrepreneurs don't, our students don't, our business owners don't. You've got to help us with this. So we took that to heart. We came back over, I don't know, five, six weeks later. We sat down with uh, Dean Olmsted and her team, and we kind of hashed out this plan to, do, to bring some intellectual property expertise and some awareness and some assistance over here, starting with Salisbury University. That's why we're here today. So I'm really glad that we've got such great turnout. I'm glad that you've all decided to spend two hours with us. We think it's going to be a really valuable experience. Now, we are extremely lucky to have Patricia Campbell with us today. I've known Patricia for probably going on 10 years now, I would say. Um, every one of our interactions has been fantastic. She is a law school professor. She's the director of the University of Maryland's Intellectual Property Law Program and of their, of their Intellectual Property Legal Resource Center. She joined the Carey Law School in 2007 after spending several years in private practice. And she currently teaches courses at Carey on patents, trademarks, and unfair competition. She has a great background. Not only does she have the academic side nailed, but she was also associate general counsel at Kajit, a telecom company back in Bethesda, Maryland. And before that, she spent time in private practice as a litigator and a transactional attorney with the Fish and Neve IP group at Ropes and Gray in Palo Alto, California, and Washington, D.C. Now, in addition to her, her, her uh, legal responsibilities at Maryland, She's also an associate professor at the Maryland Technology Enterprise Institute at the James A. Clark School of Engineering. She was educated at Carnegie Mellon, University of Pittsburgh, 
and also the Santa Clara University School of Law. So Patricia's going to take us through some really good content, and then we're going to bring up a panel, which will include Patricia and some entrepreneurs and other types of folks to drill a little bit deeper into some questions and some answers that you all might have and our moderator might have for the panel. So please join me in welcoming Patricia, and please lean into what she has to say about intellectual property. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you, Neil, and thank you, everyone, for coming out today. It's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to come over to Salisbury and talk to all of you about intellectual property, something that I think about every day. So, let me see if I can get my slides up here. They told me, oh, tab. There we are. I'm a lawyer. This wouldn't be a presentation if I didn't have my disclaimers before I start talking to you, right? So, here they are. Everything I'm going to tell you today is what I think. It's not what the University System of Maryland thinks, and it doesn't reflect the views of the University of Maryland Carey School of Law, where I teach. So just so you know, this is me, not the university speaking. And more importantly, this presentation is strictly for educational purposes. It doesn't constitute legal advice. The fact that you came out here today to listen to me talk, that you may ask questions, that I may answer your questions, that we may even chit-chat later on back by the coffee pot, there's no attorney-client relationship that's been established by your presence here today or our discussion. So just understand that. Um, if you need legal advice, I'm probably going to tell you to go find an attorney or get in touch with me in the fall when my clinic's open again. But for now, I'm wearing my professor hat, not my lawyer hat. Okay? All right, let's move on. Intellectual property. I'm so excited to tell you. We had to reschedule this presentation for today because of the, um, the weather last month. But guess what? It turns out that today is World IP Day. <laughs> totally coincidental. So happy World IP Day. Intellectual property. It's a term that means lots of different things to different people. People will come to me and say, I want to talk to you about my IP, and then I have these other questions too. And when they say IP, they mean their patents. Um, actually, intellectual property refers to a number of different intangible property rights. The thing that they have in common is they're all based on these creations of the mind. Intangible property. So it's not like real property or your car or your clothes. It's these things that we can't quite see. And typically, as lawyers, we think that there are four primary fields that comprise intellectual property. And they include trademarks, trade secrets, patents, and copyrights. Now, there are related areas to licensing, privacy, lots of other things that um, come into play when we talk about intellectual property, but those are the four main fields. And the important thing to understand is the owner of the intellectual property, whether it's a patent, a trademark, what have you, they generally have the exclusive right to use that intellectual property for a limited period of time. The length of time depends on the kind of IP that we're talking about, but typically they have this exclusive right to either use the IP themselves or authorize someone else to do it. So let's look at these four different fields. I'd like to spend my time today talking to you a little bit about what, what's a patent, what's a trademark, what's a copyright, what's trade secret, tell you a little bit about them, and help you understand how they can be important to you as entrepreneurs or owners of startup companies. So what's a patent? Well, a patent gives its owner the right to do a couple of important things. To exclude them from making, using, offering for sale, or selling the patented invention in the United States, or importing the invention into the United States. Notice, it's a negative right. It's the right to exclude others. You may own a patent. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have the right to practice the invention that's disclosed in that patent. It only means that you can prevent everybody else from doing it. And notice, if you have a U.S. patent, you have the right to prevent others from doing those things in the United States. It doesn't give you any rights in Europe, Asia, South America. So a U.S. patent only provides rights to exclude in the United States. 
Um, what you see up here is the cover sheet of a patent. This is generally what they all look like. So on the first page, you get a lot of information about who's the inventor, what's the title, what's the prior art, and there's always a drawing there. Why, as a startup company or an entrepreneur, might you be interested in patent protection? Because you probably already know, these things are expensive to get, they're expensive to maintain, and it's not an easy thing to do. So why might you want a patent? Well, lots of reasons. First of all, patents are generally thought to demonstrate value and credibility to others. And that can be important to you for a number of reasons. Perhaps you're looking for funding to get your business off the ground. If you can tell potential investors that you have a pending patent application, or better yet, an issued patent, that may get them more interested. It may show them that there's value in your company, and not just kind of moral value, or, but real cash money value. It may also tell your competitors, hey, this is a credible company. They have a patent portfolio. So that's one reason you might be interested in patent protection. But other reasons. Patents can be licensed to generate revenue. Perhaps you've created an invention, and now you realize that you can't commercialize it yourself. You may still be able to benefit from that invention because you can license it to another organization, and hopefully, if they're able to sell your invention, they may pay you royalties or licensing fees. The patent owner gets to exclude others from practicing the invention. That's the, the real kernel of value in a patent. It's that ability to prevent others from doing whatever it is that you've patented. And that means that if you believe someone is infringing your patent, you can sue them for patent infringement. And if you're successful, if you prove infringement, you may be able to collect money damages and also what we call an injunction. An injunction is an order from the court saying, stop what you're doing, infringer, and don't do it again as long as that patent is in its period of enforceability. Now, I make it sound like it's a great thing, this patent infringement lawsuit. Understand, it's extremely expensive, extremely expensive. So it's not the, the first thing that you want to do when your patent's awarded. And then one last reason that you might be interested in patent protection. Let's say you own a patent or a portfolio of patents and someone sues you for patent infringement. Well, there's always the possibility that you have a patent that that plaintiff, the person who sued you, is infringing as well. And the ability to bring um, what we call a counterclaim for patent infringement may make the whole case go away. That's sort of the Silicon Valley mentality. You look at who has the bigger stack of patents. And if you've got the really big stack, like Google or Apple, for instance, well, people may be less inclined to sue you in the first place. It's that idea of assured mutual destruction, right? In the United States, we have three different kinds of patents that are awarded by the U.S. government. They're awarded by the Department of Commerce through the uh, United States Patent and Trademark Office. So three different kinds of patents. We have design patents, utility patents, and plant patents. I'm not going to talk about plant patents today. I've been practicing for a long time, and I have never, ever worked on a plant patent case. So you, you may be working on something that involves roses or orchids or other kinds of plants, and you may be interested in that sort of protection, but we're not going to talk about it today. Design patents. Here's something that in the last probably 20 years has just taken on a new life. It used to be no one really cared very much about design patents, and there weren't that many of them awarded. They weren't considered to be that important, but today, Design patents have great value to companies. Think about Apple versus Samsung, a case that you've probably heard about in the news. A big portion of that case relates to design patents. So the law tells us that a design patent can be granted to anyone who invents a new, original, and ornamental design for an article of manufacture. An article of manufacture is just something that's man-made. You take pre-existing materials and you reshape them into something new, and now you have an article of manufacture. Notice it has to be new, has to be original, and it has to be ornamental. So a design patent protects the way something looks. It doesn't protect the way it works. If you want to protect the way something works, you don't want a design patent, you want a utility patent, and we'll talk about those in a second. 
The drawings that you see up here are drawings from three issued U.S. design patents. So the one on the left is the sole of a golf shoe. Now, I just told you that a design patent protects the way something looks, not the way it works. So to the extent that there are aspects of that design that help the golfer grip the ground better or hit the ball better or whatever, they're not protected here. They're probably in those little dashed circles that you see, and those sorts of dashed lines indicate the environment in which the patented design exists. So it's just the way it looks. In the middle is Apple's design patent for the iPhone, one of the ones that was involved in the litigation with Samsung. And over there on the far right is a scrunchie, those things that women used to wear in their hair, remember? Indeed, there's a design patent that protects that, or did, I'm sure it's expired by now. Um, a design patent is valid for 15 years from the date the patent issues. Then we have utility patents, and typically when people come to my clinic and say, I'm interested in getting a patent, this is what they want. They're interested in protecting the way their invention works, the way it's made, the way it's used. So a utility patent under US law can be issued for any new and useful process, machine, article of manufacture, or composition of matter, or for a new and useful improvement to one of those four types of things. We'll talk about what they are in just a moment. But notice, a utility patent is different than a design patent. It's valid for 20 years from the date on which the application was filed. So we look at the date of filing and count 20 years into the future. Obviously, there's going to be a period of time there where that application is being examined by the USPTO, and there won't be any enforceability during that time. So again, these are drawings from old issued utility patents from the US. Uh, the one on the left is actually a typewriter, believe it or not. It doesn't look like one. In the middle is the Wright Brothers airplane, and over on the right is Edison's light bulb. So four categories of what we call patent eligible subject matter in the United States, four different kinds of things that the government is willing to award a patent for. Processes, machines, articles of manufacture, and compositions of matter. So let me tell you what those are. A process is a series of steps, a method. So think about the process for synthesizing a drug. How do you put together the ingredients and make something that uh, causes your headache to go away or helps to treat some other disease that you have? Business methods are also processes, and that's an area where today there's a lot of question about the extent to which business methods and other things like software are really entitled to patent protection anymore. Then we have machines. A machine is a device, it has moving parts, it's made by man. Obviously that covers a lot of different things. Think about an internal combustion engine. That's a machine. Then we have articles of manufacture. I just told you what those are. That's when we have pre-existing materials and we bring them together, we reshape them into something new. So think about taking a piece of wire and bending it into a paper clip. That's an article of manufacture. Or an insulating sleeve for a coffee cup like you get at Starbucks or Pete's or somewhere like that. And then lastly, we have compositions of matter. And a composition of matter is a mixture of substances, so a chemical composition. It's what they put into Advil to make your headache go away. Not the way they put the parts together, but what's actually in there, the recipe. So those are the four different kinds of inventions that are entitled to receive, to receive patent protection in the US today. There are a lot of things, though, that cannot be patented. And it's important for you as entrepreneurs and business owners to understand what those things are. So that when you're thinking about, could I get a patent on this? you have a better sense, at least, for which side of the divide you fall on. So ideas and theories. If you have an idea for how to do something, you have a theory about how to solve a problem, but you haven't actually done it yet, you haven't figured it out, you don't know all the details, well, it's probably too early, and you're not entitled to receive a patent. Mathematical formulas, algorithms, equations aren't entitled to patent protection. Laws of nature, like the law of gravity, not entitled to patent protection. 
And naturally occurring plants and animals, including human beings, are not entitled to patent protection. So E equals MC squared, Einstein's great theory of relativity, right? Genius, but not entitled to patent protection. So you're thinking about, I have this invention. It seems like it falls into one of those four categories she just talked about. Can I get a patent on this? Well, you should understand, there are a number of different requirements that an invention must satisfy in order to be awarded a patent. It has to be novel, useful, and non-obvious. Novelty means the invention has to be new. If someone else has already done the same thing before anywhere in the world, you're not entitled to get a patent for it, even if you thought it up independently. So, the patent law tells us what it means for an invention to be novel or new. It means that it can't have been patented by someone else already. Your invention can't have been described in a printed publication, and that includes a published patent application. It can't already be in public use, and it can't be on sale. And finally, the law tells us that it can't be otherwise available to the public. That's new language that was just added a couple of years ago, and we don't yet have a court opinion that tells us just what that means. Um, the Patent Office says it's a new category of what we call prior art, of things that will count against someone's ability to get an invention, and they seem to think that it can be interpreted very broadly, but we don't know. We'll see. I just showed you that list, and it makes it sound like if you, the inventor, put your product on sale already and haven't filed a patent application, you can't get a patent. Or if you've described your invention in a printed publication like a journal article, you can't get a patent. Well, that would be how that section would be interpreted, except that we have a savings clause in the Patent Act. And the savings clause says that disclosures made by the inventor one year or less before he or she files a patent application won't count against that inventor's ability to receive a patent. That's very different from the rest of the world. In the rest of the world, once you disclose your invention by telling someone about it, publishing, publishing an article about it, offering it for sale, you're done. You've lost your ability to receive a patent. But in the U.S., we have this savings clause that gives you one year after you do those things. However, if someone else has already disclosed the same invention by putting it on sale or writing about it or whatever, it's over. That's prior art that will prevent you from getting a patent. So, novelty. The invention has to be new. How does that work? Well, we go out and we look for one other invention out there, one publication or one issued patent or one product that's been offered for sale that contains all of the elements of your invention. So let's say you invented the chair for the first time ever. It didn't exist. Best thing since sliced bread, right? And the essential elements of your chair invention are a seat, a back, and at least three legs that are attached to the bottom of the seat. Well, we go out and we look to see what's already been done, what's been disclosed, what's been patented. And we find a patent that claims a device for sitting comprising a seat, a back connected to the seat, and at least three legs attached to the bottom of the seat. Well, that has all of the same elements as your chair invention. And sadly, that means your invention isn't novel, it's not new, you can't get a patent on it. In addition to being novel, your invention has to be non-obvious. This is a, a concept that's difficult. It's difficult for the courts and for Congress, it's difficult for patent attorneys, and it's particularly difficult for inventors. Essentially, what the, the courts and what Congress are telling us is that for some inventions, there's just something about them that's not quite inventive enough to merit patent protection. Technically, the invention's novel. No one's ever done exactly the same thing before, but it's just sort of an incremental step over what was already done, you know, not a very significant step forward. It's that certain je ne sais quoi, right? We know it when we see it, 
You're not entitled to a patent, even though your invention's novel, but it's really hard to articulate the standard. And so the courts have said, there are some things we should look at. We should look at how skilled people are who work in the same field as the invention. We should look at what's already known in the so-called prior art, all those things that pre-exist the invention. And we should make a comparison and think about how different is your invention from the prior art. We think about whether your results were predictable. Would our skilled person in that same field, what, what your lawyer, lawyer will refer to as the person of ordinary skill in the art, would they have predicted that your invention would, would work? And then we also look at these other considerations. Have others been willing to purchase your invention? Have they been willing to take a license from you? Is there something that make it, makes it look like your invention is really quite attractive? Because that might indicate that, in fact, it's not obvious. So often what happens is an inventor combines together two existing things, and they work in a way that everyone would predict they might work. Well, that's an obvious invention. So let's think about your chair invention again. You've got a seat, a back, and at least three legs. Your lawyer does one of those searches and doesn't find anything out there that has a seat, a back, and three legs. But they find a couple of other patents that have been issued. One is a patent for a stool. The stool patent has a seat and at least three legs attached to the seat. Then they also find this other invention, something called a stadium seat. And a stadium seat is this device that lets people sit more comfortably on metal bleachers. And it has a seat and a back, but no legs. Well, if somebody combines together the stadium seat with the stool, they've got a chair, right? They've got a seat, a back, and at least three legs connected to the seat. That might mean the invention is obvious. If other people who work in the, the field of seating would say, well, yeah, that's obvious. I could predict that that would work. Then you're probably not entitled to get a patent. That's what obviousness is about. That's an incredibly simple example, but it gets worse from there. And then lastly, the invention has to be useful. It has to have utility. So it has to have some real world use or identifiable benefit. And that's interpreted pretty liberally, to be honest with you. Um, lots of things that seem like they're not particularly useful, they're awarded patents anyhow. The, the invention has to be useful in its current form, not after further development. People have tried writing patent applications where they say, yeah, this is a research tool, and if I keep developing it, I think that it will have a really important use. Well, that doesn't work. That doesn't satisfy the utility requirement. The claimed use also has to be credible. If someone files a patent application and they say they've come up with this new chemical compound that will cure every form of cancer in man, that's going to raise issues with the patent examiner because they're probably not going to believe you and you would have to show evidence that in fact it does. And then lastly, the invention can't contravene the laws of nature. It can't be totally inoperable. So those things that we call perpetual motion machines, well, you can't get a patent on those. Something that violates the rules of thermodynamics, not entitled to patent protection. So your invention has to be novel, useful, and non-obvious. But you also have to satisfy some disclosure requirements when you file your patent application. You have to provide a written description of the invention. So you have to actually describe what it is that you think you've invented. And you have to put in some drawings, too, typically. And that description of the invention has to be so detailed that it enables other people who are skilled in that same field to make and use your invention. And, at least historically, you had to disclose the best way of making and using your invention. The reason is, it's this quid pro quo. The, the government is going to give you this 20 year period of exclusivity, 20 years during which you can exclude everyone else from making and using and selling your invention in the United States, but they're doing that in return for something. And the return is information. They want to know what is it that you invented, how do you make it, how do you use it. 
And so if you're willing to provide that information to the public, not to the government, but to the public, then the government will give you this 20-year period of exclusivity that we call a patent. So that's patents in a real nutshell. Trade secrets is another area of intellectual property law, and people often think of trade secret law as sort of an alternative to patent protection. I can either file a patent application that discloses my invention, or I can keep it secret. That's absolutely true. But in fact, trade secrets law takes in quite a lot more in terms of subject matter than just those kinds of things that might be entitled to patent protection. So trade secrets law has been a matter of state law up until just a few months ago. Now we finally have a federal trade secrets law for the first time ever. But the states have defined what constitutes a trade secret a little bit differently from one state to another. As a general proposition, and this is consistent with the new federal statute, a trade secret can be a lot of different kinds of things. It could be a formula, a pattern, a device, a technique, a process, or some compilation of information. But whatever it is, it has to meet two separate requirements. First of all, it has to be the subject of reasonable efforts to maintain secrecy. So it's got to be secret in the first place, and you have to really try to keep it secret. And then it has to derive some kind of economic value from the fact that it's not generally known or readily ascertainable by others. So secret in the first place, you keep it secret, and you get some kind of economic value out of the fact that it's secret. And lots of different kinds of things can be trade secrets. So formulas. The classic example of a trade secret is the formula for Coca-Cola. Now, I don't know if it's still a trade secret or not. I have to imagine that you could take a bottle of Coke and run it through some piece of equipment in the laboratory, and it would tell you exactly what's in there these days. But everybody says that since 1873, when it was first invented by a pharmacist, the formula for Coke has been a trade secret, even though they've had new Coke and back to old Coke and whatever. Formulas. Processes can be trade secrets. So things like manufacturing processes, how your company builds something in-house. The people who buy your product, they can't look at the product and say, oh yeah, I can figure out all the steps that the manufacturer went through to build this. No, you don't, it's not obvious. Instead, you keep that process, that manufacturing technique secret inside your company. And that could be a really valuable trade secret for you. Designs, research, those sorts of things are often protected as trade secrets. Software. Lots of times when you buy or actually you license a piece of software, if you actually read the license terms, it will say that you uh, agree that you won't uh, disassemble, decompile, derive source code, and do all of these other bad acts. You won't figure out how that software works because it's being protected as a trade secret. Your company's strategic plans, its customer lists, its pricing information, its marketing plans, all those sorts of business information. Clearly, we've moved really far away now from the kinds of things that are entitled to patent protection, but think about all of those kinds of information that your company may have that it would be beneficial to keep secret. If you treat those things as trade secrets, they have real value to your company. So when you think about trade secret law, don't just think about inventions, processes, devices, those kinds of things. Think about your marketing plans and all of your business and financial information because they can be very valuable trade secrets for your companies. So in order to qualify as a trade secret, the information has to be secret in the first place and you, as the owner of that secret information, have to make at least reasonable efforts to keep it secret. What might you do? Well, first of all, you want to tell your employees, your co-workers, what your company considers to be a trade secret in the first place. You don't want them guessing. And then, once you've told those employees, hey, that formula for Coke and these business plans and that new cell phone that I'm going to introduce to the market next month, those are my trade secrets. 
you want them obligated to keep that information secret. And so most companies in the U.S. today will require their employees to sign um, confidentiality agreements of some sort. It may be a, a bigger employment agreement that incorporates confidentiality provisions, but it says the employee understands that your company has these trade secrets, that they're important to the company, and the employee promises that he or she won't disclose that information to anyone else and won't use it for their own purposes. They'll only use it to help the company. Your vendors, your business partners, you want them to sign confidentiality agreements as well. You may have to tell them information about what you have planned or how your process works or what um, the best way of building your device might be. You want them to keep that information secret, so you ask them to sign a non-disclosure agreement, an NDA. You've got this trade secret information. You've told your employees, we don't want you disclosing this information to anyone else, but does that mean that you tell everyone in the company what that trade secret is? Absolutely not. You only disclose it on a need-to-know basis. If you're the Coca-Cola company, are you going to tell the people who drive the trucks what the formula is for Coke? No, absolutely not. They don't have any reason to know that formula. So you only tell your trade secrets to even the people within your company who have a need to know them. Keep the information secret. Then you take physical measures as well to protect your information. So confidential information, trade secrets, you keep it locked up. Lock file drawers. Put alarms on your doors. Don't do what I do and have these huge stacks of paper all over your desk. That's terrible, right? If you've got trade secret information laying out on your desk, that's just really bad. If you have documents that contain your trade secrets, put a legend on them so that it says Startup Company Inc., confidential and proprietary. And then when someone picks up that paper, they don't have to guess. It's staring them right in the face. It says this is confidential and proprietary information. Put that legend on every page of the document, not just the cover sheet, because it's too easy to tear off the top sheet. And then, if you're applying for grants or loans or whatever from governmental agencies or, or others, and you have to disclose some of your trade secret information as part of that application um, process, make sure you understand what that governmental agency or other organization can do with your trade secret information. Can they share it with others? Who's going to have access to it? Is it going to be peer reviewed by people from outside the agency? Just make sure you know before you submit those applications. People ask me all the time, why should I get, why should I protect my information as a trade secret rather than getting a patent on it? It doesn't seem to make any sense to me. Well, there are lots of different reasons that you might want to do that. First of all, the thing that you're trying to protect might not be eligible for patent protection. If it's business information, financial information, marketing plans, clearly that's not patent eligible. You may also have inventions that you're really concerned about, you know, are they really going to merit patent protection? And so you decide that um, protecting them as a trade secret instead is a better route to go. Maybe patenting is too expensive. Uh, <coughs> Lots of lawyers will give you different estimates about what it costs to obtain a patent, but you can pretty much figure anywhere from twenty dollars to $100,000, depending on the complexity of your invention, and that's just in the United States. If you're thinking about international protection, you know, the numbers go off the board. So if you can't afford that, then perhaps trade secret protection is a route you would want to consider. Maybe you're concerned that that 20-year period of exclusivity isn't long enough for you. You know, you've got the, the next formula for Coke, and you want to protect it for another 100 years, but if you were to patent it, you would only have 20 years of protection. Well, if the invention is really something that you can maintain as a secret, you could potentially have 100 years of protection. Have to protect it, though. We already talked about manufacturing processes, things that are used in-house. The, the end user can't figure out what the process was by looking at the product. That might be a good thing 
to protect as a trade secret rather than patenting it, because if you file a patent application, you have to disclose all the steps in your process to the public. And then, similarly, products that are difficult to reverse engineer might better be protected as trade secrets than patenting them. Two more areas of the law that I want to cover in the, the time that we have remaining, and they're trademarks and copyrights. Trademarks are completely different from patents or trade secrets. A trademark's a brand. On your way here today, you probably encountered so many trademarks you couldn't even count them, just driving down the street. McDonald's, Arby's, Exxon, Sunoco. Think about all those brands that you pass just driving down the street. Those are trademarks and they're incredibly valuable. So what's a trademark? Well, it could be a word, it could be a symbol, a logo, a tagline, something like that. The important thing is it's used in connection with the sale of a product or a service. If it's a service, we call it a service mark. And the thing that it does is it distinguishes those products from other products that are offered in the marketplace and it indicates their source. So you go to an athletic store, you want to buy a new pair of running shoes and you see lots of different shoes sitting there on the shelf. There's the one with the swoosh, there's the one with the two things that come down the side, and there are lots of other ones. Well, you see the one with the swoosh, and you think, oh, I know who that is, it's Nike. That's how valuable that logo is for them, the swoosh. The swoosh is a separately registered trademark of Nike Inc. Incredibly valuable branding. Um, you see the another pair of shoes sitting there, and they've got that sort of UA thing going on. Well, we all know who that is, that's Under Armour. But just seeing those marks tells us where those products come from, and it tells us something more about them. We expect that they're high quality, that they're highly engineered shoes, and you know they're going to help us run better, they're going to make our feet more comfortable, whatever. So those are all aspects of trademark ownership. And again, only the owner of a trademark has the right to use that mark or to authorize others to do it. If you're Nike or Under Armour or Asics, you have those really valuable marks, your name, the, uh, the design, everything else that's associated with it, your taglines like protect this house or just do it. You're not going to let anyone else use those marks because it would create consumer confusion. If people saw that Nike swoosh on a pair of dress shoes, they might be confused and think, well, did Nike make these? Where, where do these come from? And that's what trademarks are intended to prevent, consumer confusion. When you're thinking about marks for your businesses, you want those trademarks to be distinctive. I've talked to a lot of business people, and business people always believe that trademarks should tell you something about the product or the service that's being offered. In fact, as far as the law is concerned, that's the worst kind of trademark. They can't be protected, or at least not initially. And so you want your marks to be very distinctive. That means that you want them to be either suggestive, arbitrary, or fanciful. Now I've put something up here. It's a diagram that was uh, done some time ago by the International Trademark Association, and it shows us this continuum of distinctiveness. So clear over here on the left, we have generic marks. You can never protect a generic mark. If I try to sell this product and I call it water, <laughs> that's what it is, right? I can't register that. I can't get trademark protection on water for water. Descriptive marks are also problematic. A descriptive mark is one that it's not the generic term, but it describes the product or the service that's being offered. So the example that Intel used here in their schematic was American Airlines. When American Airlines adopted that name as their mark, it really described exactly what it was. It was an American airline. And as a result, it couldn't be protected as a trademark until people actually came to realize that this was American Airlines. It wasn't Southwest or United or Continental. And so it acquired distinctiveness. I would encourage you as brand owners not to adopt descriptive marks. They're very hard to protect. 
Um, it takes time, it takes a lot of marketing effort, probably years before you can really protect those descriptive marks. So think about something else. Look for a mark that's suggestive, arbitrary, or fanciful. Suggestive marks tell us something. They sort of tell us a little bit about the product or the service, but we have to stop and think to figure out what's going on. So this Burger King mark for a fast food restaurant that sells hamburgers and other fast food, you know, if we think about it, we look at that, well, there's kind of a hamburger implied there, right? I can sort of see the bun, and Burger King sort of looks like the hamburger in the bun. And burger, okay, they sell hamburgers, but I don't know what the king thing's all about. It's suggestive. And that mark can be registered and protected. Arbitrary marks are stronger. They're words that exist in the English language, but they have nothing to do with the product or the service that's being sold. So Apple for computers, cell phones, computer software, it's a really strong mark. It has nothing to do with the product. And then lastly, fanciful marks are made up words. They're words that don't exist in the English language, and they're considered to be the strongest kind of trademark or service mark. So think about Kodak for film and cameras, um, Xerox, all of the drug names, you know, Viagra, Advil, those sorts of things. They're just made up words. And that makes them extremely strong trademarks because people can't associate anything else with those marks other than your product or service. <coughs> Let's see, we've got a couple minutes left. So when you're developing these marks for your businesses, if you haven't registered them yet, you still want people to know that you consider them to be your trademark or your service mark. And so before the mark is registered, it's okay to go ahead and use TM or SM next to it. That tells the world that you consider this to be your trademark or your service mark. Once you've registered with the USPTO, the United States Patent and Trademark Office, then you can start using the R in the circle. That means that it's a registered trademark. But don't use that R in the circle until you've actually registered. You want to use the mark in a way that sets it apart from other text on a page. If you're doing advertising or something, it makes it jump out. It doesn't look the same as all of the other text. So use all capital letters or a descriptive type. Use bigger print. Use color. Use something that sets your mark off from everything else on the page. And use it in a consistent manner. Don't have it looking one way one day and a different way the next day. Some companies use the word brand after their mark. Think about Band-Aid brand adhesive bandages. And that tells us that Band-Aid is a brand, it's a trademark. You don't have to do that, but it's an option. And then, you don't want your mark to become generic. <clears throat> Excuse me. Trademarks should always be followed by generic nouns. So aspirin pain reliever, super glue adhesive. See, we put those generic nouns after the mark. Don't make marks plural, they're not nouns. Don't say we rode on two escalators. You would actually say we rode on two escalator people movers or whatever, I don't know. Don't say we bought new thermoses. We bought new thermos insulated bottles. Right? You want to put that generic noun after the mark. Don't use trademarks as a verb, so don't say please Xerox this document for me, or go Google that and see what you find. And don't make marks possessive. Every mark that you see up there, with one exception, used to be a registered trademark. They've now lost their ability to serve as trademarks because they've become generic. We've treated them as the name that we use to describe a whole class of products or services. So now if I say aspirin to you, you don't know whether I mean the Bayer product or somebody else's aspirin type product, right? The only one that's still hanging on is Xerox. They do a lot of preventative advertising every year to try to keep their mark strong. And then lastly, I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about copyright protection. <clears throat> In my experience, at least, copyrights are often overlooked by startup companies. They're an important area of intellectual property rights, but a lot of companies just don't think that copyright protection really applies to them. Maybe it doesn't 
but think about it. Think about whether you, as entrepreneurs and owners of startup companies, have things that might be entitled to copyright protection. The law tells us that copyright protection exists in original works of authorship. You can't have copied from someone else, but if you've created something yourself, well, then you already satisfy one of the requirements. And it has to be fixed in a tangible medium of expression. That means if you have the idea in your head for a new novel about some school kids in England and how they have this magic thing going on, well, that's nice, but you're not entitled to copyright protection. But when you write Harry Potter, like it's actually written down on paper or in your computer or whatever, it's fixed, now you have copyright in that work. Notice, copyright protection does not extend to ideas, procedures, processes, systems, methods of operation, concepts, principles, discoveries. Those kinds of things may be protected by patent laws, they may be protected as trademarks, but copyright doesn't protect those sorts of things. It protects original works of authorship that have been fixed in a tangible medium. So the law protects the expression of ideas, not the ideas themselves. And that's a hard one to really define. So we think about what kinds of things aren't protectable as expression. That helps us to understand what expression is. Names and slogans. Um, all of the things that we just talked about as trademarks, they're not protectable under copyright law. Ideas, plans, methods, systems, devices, some of those things may be protected by the patent laws, they're not protected by copyright. Blank forms. Do you ever go to a diner and the waitress comes over to take your order and she has that pad of those green receipts that you get? She writes down that you want a piece of pie and a cup of coffee and later on you get your little um, your check, right? Those blank forms, they're not protectable under the copyright laws. Common property, things like calendars and rulers, aren't protected. Now you can go out and buy a beautiful calendar that has pictures of Tuscany or the south of France or dogs or whatever on it. Sure, there's copyright protection for those photographs, but the idea that the year is 12 months long, that it starts out with January and ends with December, that's common property and copyright law doesn't protect those things. Basic story ideas, what the law calls sense of fair, the idea that the boy and the girl get each other in the end, that's not protected. Yet once you layer characters onto it, and now we have Romeo and Juliet, or we have Scarlett O'Hara and Rhett Butler, now we've got protection, but just that basic, they get each other in the end idea, that's not protectable. Recipes aren't protectable, lists of ingredients. So the idea that an omelet is three eggs and you put it in a frying pan and you keep stirring it until it all cooks, you can't protect that. If you put together a hundred recipes though, and you give detailed instructions about how to make each of them, and you have some photographs in there and you write about how the smell of the omelet cooking reminds you of when you were a kid at home, now you've got a cookbook, that's protectable. But just the list of bare ingredients is not. Typeface, there are all kinds of things that aren't protected. So you start to get a sense for what isn't part of copyright law. Let's look at what is. There are all of these different kinds of things that can be protected and that may pertain to your businesses. Literary works is a really broad category. It includes books, articles, scripts, letters, lectures, manuals, catalogs, and computer programs. If you're in the software business, think about copyright protection. Musical works are protected, choreographic works, and choreographic works doesn't just include the diagrams for how the dancers are going to move around the stage. It also relates to the digitized movements of video characters. If you're in the gaming business, think about copyright law. Dramatic works are protected. Pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works. Here's one of the classic areas of copyright protection, right? Paintings, sculptures, cartoons, maps, all of those things that we would fully expect to be covered. Audiovisual works are protected. If you're making videos that somehow relate to your product or your service, think about copyright law. 
sound recordings, architectural works are protected today. Maybe you are in the construction business. Not only are the blueprints and your plans protectable, but the structures themselves, as long as they are habitable, are now protected under copyright law. So what does copyright get you as a business owner or a copyright owner? Well, a copyright owner has the right to do a number of different things or to authorize somebody else to do these things. And that means to reproduce the work. You wrote that novel, you don't want anyone else making copies of it, so the right to make copies is one of the rights of the copyright owner. The right to create derivative works. You don't want someone taking your new novel and writing something that's sort of inspired by it, right? We call that a derivative work. You take a pre-existing thing and you change it somehow, but we can still see what's going on there. Or they take your novel and turn it into a motion picture and don't ask you for permission. That's a derivative work. Distributing copies to the public by sale, rental, or leasing is one of the rights of the copyright owner. Performing the work publicly. You wrote a play. The ability to perform that work publicly, that's one of your rights. Or displaying the work publicly. Maybe you're a sculptor or an artist. And then for sound recordings, to perform the work publicly by means of digital audio transmission. We're talking about satellite radio there. Do you have to register your copyright? I get asked this all the time by entrepreneurs. And the answer is no, you don't. There is no longer any requirement under federal law that you file a copyright registration in order to be the copyright owner or to say that you're, you have protections. These days, copyright protection automatically attaches to a work as soon as you fix it in a tangible medium of expression. So if we're thinking about that novel again, as soon as you write it, you own copyright in it. You're the author, you own it, you have copyright rights. You don't have to publish it, and you don't have to register it with the US Copyright Office. You may register your copyright if you want to, and it comes with certain benefits. If you want to sue someone for copyright infringement, you have to have registered before you can file that lawsuit. Whoops. And then lastly, we have this thing called fair use, and you should be aware of it, because it could impact what you're doing. The law says that the fair use of a copyrighted work, did the sound just go out? Yeah. yeah. Should I continue? Oh, it's back now. OK. All right, good. The law says that the fair use of a copyrighted work for certain purposes does not constitute copyright infringement. Look at how limited they are. Criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. If you're just copying someone else's works because you think, why not? or you think, I'm a poor startup company, I don't have a lot of money, I'm just going to copy this and not pay for a license, that's not fair use. So be aware, in some instances, it may be okay to copy someone else's work, but be very careful, because those are the only reasons that you're permitted to do, well, those are most of the reasons that you're permitted to do it without running afoul of the copyright laws. And so the courts would look at, why did you do this copying? Is it for commercial purposes? Did you copy someone else's work in order to make money? Or did you do it because you're writing a paper, you're a student at school, and you copied a paragraph out of someone else's work, you indented it, you know, it's single-spaced in your paper, you dropped a footnote, that's fine, that's okay, that's fair use. They look at the nature of the work. Is it um, a factual work? Is it really creative work? What is it? How much was used? Did you use one paragraph out of a thousand page treatise, or did you copy an entire chapter out of someone's book? And then lastly, you think about the effect on the market for that work. Have you destroyed their market? And if so, then likely what you've done is in fair use. So I want to conclude just by telling you one last thing, and that is that I always encourage my startup uh, clients, the entrepreneurs we work with, to think about developing a comprehensive IP portfolio. Don't focus exclusively on one area of the law and say, I'm only interested in patents. 
Maybe you are, but think about what else you could be doing to create value in your companies. What other IP rights do you have that could become valuable assets to you? So, my piece of clip art here uh, of an old, old computer, right? You run a computer company. How might you be able to use the IP laws to create value in your company? Well, think about utility patents. Utility patents protect things like the functional circuitry inside that computer that you've just built. Then there are design patents. Design patents might protect the way your computer looks. Remember those old Apple computers from some years ago that had the really rounded backs and they came in five different colors? You know, that, that could have been protected by a design patent. I'm sure it was. Trademarks. What's your branding? What names are you applying to that product? What slogans are you using with it? Does it say Dell on it? Well, Dell's a really valuable trademark for a computer company. Do you have a slogan like, this changes everything? Protect it as a trademark. Think about copyright. You're a computer company. Well, software is protected by copyrights. But also, perhaps you have a website where you describe your product. That may be entitled to copyright protection. Maybe there are manuals that come in the box with your computer. That manual can be protected by copyright laws. And then lastly, trade secrets. What are your marketing plans? What about all of your financial information? Are there secret manufacturing processes that you use to build that computer in your facility? So again, think about forming a comprehensive IP portfolio to protect all of your different kinds of IP assets rather than focusing exclusively on one area. And so that's intellectual property law for you in less than an hour. Um, time. We ready to start with the panel, or what do you want to do? Thank you very much. You're very welcome. There you go. Great. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, that was an incredible amount of information. Um, and uh, just to get started, I'm going to quickly introduce myself and then introduce our panelists. Um, my name, by the way, is Ann Balduzzi. I am the uh, RBI, or the Rural Business Innovation Initiative Program Manager for TEDCO. Um, and just to give you a little bit of information about TEDCO, by the way, this is Patricia's bio that we get through here. Um, the uh, TechCo program um, for RBI is designed to actually assist um, startup companies and small technology-based businesses that are located in rural business areas of Maryland. And we're here to help you advance to the next level of success. Um, the program offers professional ongoing mentoring and targeted projects to help companies succeed, and there's no cost to the company. So we have two mentors here today with us. Um, Barry and Tiffany, if they'll raise their hands in the back of the room, uh, we'll be sticking around later. So if you have um, if you have a, an idea for a business and you want some additional uh, counseling or mentoring, uh, please come see us. Um, also, to give you, I'm going to ask my panelists go ahead to get up as I uh, talk a little bit about myself and give you some background information. Um, go ahead, and, go ahead and get up here. Um, uh, so in addition to working for Tedco, I myself am also an entrepreneur. By the way. Um, I founded my own startup company and was also issued a patent on data match analysis. So I have navigated what we call the IP journey. Um, and it's, it's not an easy journey, but we've got some great entrepreneurs here uh, today that are going to help us uh, as we go through some questions and Q&A. And at the end of the session, by the way, we're going to open it up to the audience so you too um, can answer or ask your own questions, assuming we haven't covered the question already. Um, so with that in mind, let me go ahead and get started and introduce our panelists right here. Uh, sitting right over here to my left is uh, Elaine Bryancom. He is the CEO of Kitchology, which is his third startup company. And he also um, has more than 25 years of expertise in the mobile device, app, and big data industries with a strong knowledge of intellectual property issues. He holds a PhD in electrical engineering from MIT and has over 220 patents and patent applications. In fact, his favorite patent was issued by Google, was issued, uh, yeah, used by Google to sue Apple, excuse me. Um, and now we have Wally Godo. Wally is a practicing patent attorney in Washington, D.C. 
and Wally actually is also an entrepreneur. Um, he has extensive experience in obtaining and enforcing patents. Um, he's the founder of a company called named Gracular. And before practicing law, he was a principal system engineer at Northrop Grumman. He also received his JD from the University of Baltimore School of Law and his BSEE from Northeastern University. Uh, next up is Mike Steele. Um, he is the founder of Moto Breeze, which is a manufacturer of wind-powered automatic motorcycle chain oilers located in Southern Maryland. Uh, prior to Moto Breeze, Mike spent over 30 years as an engineer in the defense industry, primarily with the U.S. Navy. He holds a BS in mechanical engineering from North Carolina State University and has one issued U.S. patent and patents pending internationally. Um, our next two panelists um, actually uh, are graduates. Both of them are graduates of Salisbury University. Uh, Janet Lynn Wilson, um, who is currently the finance director for Pocomoke City, but has a BS degree from Salisbury University and an MPA degree from Walden University. After winning Salisbury's 2003 Bernstein competition, she went on to invent and patent the Beecham, an easy to use folding canopy tent that protects against sun damage. Her product was sold via Toys R Us and Walmart's websites, and it was also sold here at the Salisbury University bookstore. Our next Salisbury graduate is Mike Varnas. He had received his BS in Information Systems uh, from Salisbury University, and now serves as the Vice President of Business Development at AH Pharma in Hebron, Maryland. Since starting AH Pharma, Mike has worked closely with counsel on the prosecution of several patents and a trademark. And he is currently in the process of obtaining a utility patent for his own invention, which is pending examination by the United States Patent and Trademark Office. So as you can see, we have a very qualified panel of experts here that have actually navigated the IP journey and successfully navigated as well. Um, so I'm going to start out by asking some questions that I had when I was an entrepreneur looking to sort of, you know, where do you get started and what is really, what does it cost to get a patent? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and open it up to the panel, whoever wants to start first, um, if you can give us some ideas as to what kind of expenses you might have had in navigating the patent process. Um, all right. I'll take it. Um, so to get a patent, um, it, it, well, you start, or you should be starting first with trying to see whether or not your invention is novel. And to do that, um, depending on the company you use, I would say maybe around seven hundred dollars or thereabout, um, maybe seven to a thousand dollars. Now, after that, to actually draft it, to draft the patent application itself, um, the cost really depends on the type of technology. Um, if it's simple, if it's something simple or something more difficult, so I would say maybe between five to ten grand, um, and. Once it's drafted and filed to actually prosecute it, in other words, um, after you draft it, file it you know, with the claims, you submit it, the government comes back and say, oh, guess what? What you're trying to do is not new. It's been done before. So somebody has to respond. Assuming you were using counsel to do that or an attorney, um, that might, you know, maybe if it's a firm, I would say maybe around 35 to maybe 5,500. I mean, it all depends on the firm. If it's a solo practitioner or a well-established firm, um, and that process might go on for five or six tries, let's say, or it might be the very first, or, or you might just file it and then just um, get it allowed. So you can't really say beforehand. So all in all, I would say at least 10k. At least. Okay, um, Mike. I know you did it yourself. Um, so, yeah. how did that process work? You went around. You didn't use an attorney, correct? Right. Yeah. So, um, for me, that whole process that uh, we all kind of just described um, was about a thousand dollars. And but just in in you know, money put out. But it was about four months of my time working on working on it because I really didn't know what I was doing. I really didn't know, you know, I was starting with zero patent knowledge, so I went and bought, uh, an, an attorney recommended that I read a book called Patent It Yourself, and it's a, it, it's a really good book, even if you are going to patent, using a patent attorney, because it takes you through the whole process, explains, excuse me, uh, how, how to write the patent, um, 
but yeah, it was about a thousand dollars in about four months of my time. Um, and mentioned I also have some international patents. Um, I actually just got a patent issued in Australia last month, and that one was, I want to say, about a thousand dollars in total filing costs and all that kind of stuff. The the expensive part of it internationally is when you start you file what they call a PCT application, which really just extends your time frame up to up to 31 months. That was when it started getting expensive. That was about four thousand dollars to file that one, and then I think the European Patent Office when I filed that one was about thirty five hundred dollars. And I'm not finished with the with Europe or uh, Canada yet, so those I've still got costs to come on those. But that's been my experience so far. Um, a couple of points to, uh, to, to think about. Uh, in, since I'm an old guy, I've been around the block, and I used to be the chief technology officer of a company called InterDigital um, that uh, was finding a fair amount of uh, intellectual property as 700 patents a year. Um, so there was a very big spread. Um, the cost to get a patent issued went from $12,000, if you were on the lucky side, the high-end mark was $380,000. And um, this went for 17 iterations, and the reason why we pursued it is because the licensing revenue we would get from it was perceived to be very high. So I, um, they are, there is a concept of a provisional patent. By the way, the presentation that you saw on IPR was absolutely outstanding, and uh, I think uh, uh, really, really great job to do the introduction about the, the different piece of intellectual property, so kudos. Um, there is a concept of intellectual property, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, provisional patent, too much sleep, not, um, and that gives you a year to kind of make up uh, your ID, uh, you know, after one year you have to transform this provisional patent into a non-provisional patent. And if you have an entrepreneur, this is something that I would work with counsel to figure out if you can do, because it's not as expensive, it creates a lot of options. You basically defer the moment when you have to start writing claims and dealing with those claims. So this is something that you have to think about. Uh, and they are much less expensive because the threshold to get a provisional patent is lower, and it allows you, as soon as it had been filed, to use patent pending. The other thing also to note is, in some cases, if you're an entrepreneur, the patent will issue after you no longer own the company. <laughs> because you've sold the company. We filed at Kitchology six patents. One of them will never get issued. That was not the point. It was meant to hold the date, and we are very systematic about using it. So when you work with counsel, you learn quickly that the four to five years it takes you, it takes for the patent to get issued, might not be your problem. And you have to really thus think about the patent prosecution as a development of a product that has stagger cost over time. Um, the thing also to remember is once the patent is issued, you have to pay fees. At the beginning, the fees are not that expensive. And then they go higher and higher and higher. So when you go toward the 18th, 19th, 20th year, you've got the cost that the US Patent Office or the Japanese Patent Office or the, in Europe, the EPO charges more and more. So you need to think about how much it costs to get a patent, but when are the bills going to be due, and who is going to pay those bills, and take that into account in your patenting strategy. Good. Good. Go ahead. I did exactly like Mike did. Okay. He's going to come back. Um, I did um, submit a provisional application, which did give me one year. I went to the library and um, Public, uh, got the book, How to Write Your Own Patent, and I looked at the format that was on the U.S. website for the Patent Office of how prior patents were written and followed the detailed instructions of the book. And within the one year, I then fine-tuned my non-provisional patent application and submitted it, and I was awarded it. Um, so it probably cost me, like you're saying, $1,000 um, because I, I didn't have the resources to hire an attorney. I can see why people do it, because it's very, very hard, but it is doable by yourself. But attorneys make it much easier. Okay. Uh, I had somewhat of a uh, unique experience, because uh, an old family friend is a, a patent attorney, so he offered to write everything for free if I basically came up with the, the language. He gave me a format, what I would need to do. I, I wrote a couple pages and basically just paid the fees. Uh, and I, I do some CAD at uh, my day job, so I did the CAD work myself. 
and paid his experts, I think it was about $300, to transfer it into what I believe is some specific format that they require, I guess, but I'm not, not too keen on what that might be. Um, so I was, I was very lucky in that regard, but I can sort of speak to the cost. Um, the, the company that I worked for was trying to get a trademark, uh, and we were negotiating with a company overseas that had a very similar mark, uh, and ours was fairly descriptive. It wasn't a very strong mark. Uh, so that was very expensive because we had to go back and forth and you're negotiating with someone overseas and you're paying the attorney a couple hours here and there just to shoot off a couple emails or, or a letter or two. And, uh, you know, in the end, they're going to fight it out for you, but I would say all in all it probably costs between ten and $20,000 to get a mark. And for a small company that's not like Dell or someone that's really going to work to defend it, it might not be worth it to you. So. Um, speaking just uh, as a young person that doesn't have a lot of money for something that I wanted to do, a uh, guy I work with in town that does a lot of manufacturing said something really wise to me once, and I, I'm sure it's backed up by research somewhere that I don't know about. Uh, but he said that just simply putting the patent pending on your invention, if it's something tangible, that almost always will defer or, uh, deter about half the people or more from going out there and, and trying to take it from you. And that sort of just buys you the time. Uh, so if you're making something tangible, I think uh, just the provisional patents are pretty strong. It's a good route to go. Um, I also did um, apply for and receive a trademark for <coughs> the name Beecham. So that was, um, again, I did that on my own. And that is not very hard and not very expensive to do either. Good. And uh, Patricia, does the Maryland uh, Intellectual Property Legal Resource Center, does that help when entrepreneurs come and meet with does it help reduce the cost of the, the filing and other things? Yeah, certainly. Um, the Maryland Intellectual Property Legal Resource Center is a legal clinic that I run through the University of Maryland, and my students provide free legal assistance to startups and entrepreneurs. Uh, we work on all of the different things that I just talked to you about, so we assist with filing patent applications, trademark applications, we do copyright registrations, we help people protect their, tr their trade secrets. Um, if you were qualified as a small entity and you wanted to file a patent application, your filing fees would be about $600 initially. Good. Great. Um, great answers. Thanks for that information. Um, I know a lot of people, um, when you're talking about patents, um, a, a lot of advice that I've received was going out and doing a prior art search. Um, and a prior art search is sort of just determining has somebody else gone out there and, and done it. Um, so I'm wondering if the entrepreneurs can talk a little bit about um, how they did their prior art search and whether or not, you know, what tools or resources you used to help you determine if there was somebody out there that had already created that patent. Um, I went to the U.S. Patent website and you can do a search and you can put in keywords of any particular part of your product and you would be amazed at back in the 1800s but as Professor Campbell said, that if it, something 100 years ago had the same content of your pro, um, product now, that it's not patentable. So you definitely have to do a lot of research. And when you do find one that has something <coughs> similar, it's like a tree with tons of roots, because you'll find one, and we look, open that one, there's like five more, and you keep on going down and down and down. It's um, a lot in-depth research. <coughs> Any other resources? I, I was going to say, my, my experience was uh, was similar. Um, I did it myself. I went to the um, US, PT, US Patent and Trademark Office website. They've got some pretty good training on there, PowerPoint slides that will <coughs> tell you exactly how to do it. I mean, the, the keyword search is the most basic one, and that one, you really need to figure out what art unit you're you're in. Like, mine was in mostly, like, lubrication type things. So you really have to find the art the art unit of the patent office and that's where you really need to dig deep and like like she said you you get one patent and you may um uh go and, and see all the other patents that references you really need to go look at those too to see if they're if they're similar um and you also don't want to only look in the u.s you have to look all over the world too so there's a I think the website was called eSpaceNet or something mm -hmm. like that, but it's Space a place Net. where you can go and it's got all the patents from all over the world and you can kind of do searches on there too because I found Chinese patents that I, that I couldn't read. They had some you know, basic translated versions, but um, 
but I think I did a, a fairly thorough search. Um, I think the when the patent when the European Patent Office examined mine during the the PCT, which is Paris Cooperation Treaty uh, phase of the of getting an international patent, um, they found three or four others, even U.S. patents that I didn't find that were that were you know had had some applicability. So. Um, Google patent does a very good search. Um, I think one of the things as an entrepreneur, there's a lot of free services where you enter keywords or key competitors and then you can get a sense of what they're filing and then you, know, you learn quickly what happens on <coughs> Mondays and what happens on Tuesdays with respect to uh, publications and grants and follow it that way. Um, I think you should do a lot of research but realize that unless you are unlucky, and I'll explain that in a second, um, the first time you get something from the U.S. Patent Office, you're going to get a rejection because they found this prior art, this prior art, or they found this one thing that combined with that thing and combined with that thing and combined with that thing, <laughs> anticipate what you have. And your reaction the first time around is, you've got to be kidding me. No one who is going to think to look into cooking ustensile, uh, a, a, a cooking method, a car, and a manufacturing process for drilling for creating a drill, put that together, anticipate what you have. The first time that happens to you, you go, this cannot be happening, but this is where good counsel can help you. So you should do a lot of work. You shouldn't go too, too much, because then you have to file all this information that that creates a record. Um, so you have to be careful that way, but realize that unless you are unlucky, you're gonna get something back. And the reason why I say it's unlucky is because you want to push the envelope of what you're gonna claim. So if the first time you come, that happens to me once, and we had a claim, we had a patent, 43 claims, they all came back, and my first phone call was to the law firm and say, what did you do wrong? What did we do wrong? Because we, okay, uh, you know, you didn't claim enough. So there's gonna be a lot of back and forth. It's called a prosecution. It can get frustrating. This is where uh, having a good resolve, having, you know, studied, you know, having books or having good counsel helps you navigate through this. So. Do enough of the work to know that it's worthwhile. Do enough of the work that to, to you know, avoid an obvious par art, but realize part of the joy of doing the patent work and having good partners in your law firm or your spouse or your kids that you can you know, go search this and figure <laughs> it out is to go to this back and forth. And at the end, it's, it's, it's sweet. And realize that in some cases, the patents will not be issued. And in some cases, the, the purpose of you filing is not as much to um, protect your art, maybe. It might be that you're using the patent filing as a way to prevent your competition from you know, getting after you at the end. Um, I will second using Google Patents, actually. Um, at work, that's what I use, even though the USPTO's website is there. Um, Google Patents just happens to be a little better. Although I don't really do prior art searches, but occasionally I have to. Now, getting back to saving money, I would say if I were advising someone that can't really afford an attorney, I would say that the easiest way or the better way to go would be to conduct your own prior art search, okay? Now, provide the list of prior art to the attorney, including um, whatever your invention is, or maybe even draft the application yourself, or at least, let's say, the provisional patent, some form of it. And you can think of a provisional patent, it's similar to like a research paper or something, or like even a patent, it's similar to a research paper, something along that line, and hand that to the attorney. Because it makes his job a lot easier coming up with the end product. And the reason you do that is the claims are the most important part of the application itself. And it's always better to have somebody very knowledgeable to actually draft the claims. And then from that point on, you could take over, if you, if you like, um, the actual prosecution, or you could just you know, go back and forth with the attorney. But that way you save on cost, attorney cost, if you will. I would, uh, I would just third the Google patent. I'm, uh, I come from an IT background, so I might be overly critical, but the USPTO website's very slow. <coughs> and you, you put in one word or something like that, and it, it sort of takes a while. It's more of an art form trying to find what you're looking for. Um, Google seems to be really user-friendly in my experience. Good. Yeah, I, I used Google myself as well. 
Um, how do you all decide which team members' names go on the patent? This is assuming you've got a team of people. Um, you know, who, who actually gets to put their name on the patent? Well. <laughs> You're the lawyer. You have to tell them all. <laughs> <laughs> you really, really have to make sure, absolutely make sure that you have the name, only the names of the inventors on there. Okay, because that might be a reason why, assuming your competitor were to know later on or something, that might be a reason to invalidate your patents. So only the inventors goes there. Um, so, and what that really means is only the inventors of the claims, right, not the actual disclosure or what you think the invention is. The invention or the application might have been about A, B, C, and D. However, when the claims were written, for whatever reason, it, it could also be because the um, USPTO told you, oh, you claim you have too many inventions, and they, they, they say, oh, you have to restrict it to one invention. So you're only claiming D, even though the application discloses A, B, C, D, and E, but the claims are only directed to D. Only the inventors of D should appear in the list of inventors. There is a law. I think yeah. it's you have to be very strict. Um, you can you can use from a team building exercise. You can help people become inventors. Um, let's say uh, we're gonna we're gonna invent a widget, and um, in one of the claims we're gonna say it's a widget like in claim one, where the color of the outer rim is yellow, orange, blue, brown. Am I missing something? And then someone says, oh, Violet. Oh, yeah, that's right, Violet. OK. Bob, you are now an inventor because we get the Violet. So <laughs> that's, you know, that's, that's an inside practice type of a deal. So you can work this. And, and um, folks uh, that have never got inventions, the first time you get your patent, it's a thrill. I mean, it's like you know, a very big deal. So you can use that as a team uh, you know, consolidation. You can tell people, I can't pay you, but you're going to get your name on a patent. or you have your uh, summer intern, and we're going to work you to death, hypothetically, uh, and you're going to get on patents on. But at the end of the day, if the, if the claim gets knocked off, um, then the inventors that were associated with that claims have to be removed. You have to certify that. And so the record keeping that you have to do on who contributed to what claim, you have to be super careful because um, it's an easy way, and that would be a shame, if a competitor basically knocks off your patent because you were not truthful in what you weren't to the U.S. Patent Office. Um, when you file the original patent and when the certificate of issuance comes out and you recertify the fact that the right folks were truly inventors. But you can try to help the process to, to turn that into the team owning you know, this patent having to go through. Mine was extremely easy because uh, up until I filed the, uh, the actual patent application, nobody in the world knew anything about my invention other than me. It was a very lonely four months <laughs> trying to keep it to myself. But even my wife, because she has Facebook, she didn't, I, I gave her the opportunity, but I said, if I tell you, you can't tell anybody. You can't put it on Facebook or anything. She goes, don't tell me then. So mine was easy. <laughs> Mine's similar. I did not have that myself. It was very lonely. <laughs> just me, myself, and I. My invention sort of includes a, a tangible as well as a software portion. Uh, and I'm not, not so big on coding microprocessors and that sort of thing. So I found an old friend that is. And I, I sort of, as you said, I offered him you know, equity in the company. Be an inventor. I'm not going to pay you. But go in on this with me and develop it. And if it works, it works. And we'll be you know, rich someday. <laughs> Great. Good. Um, how long does it take to get a patent, and are there any ways to speed up the review process? And also, if one of the attorneys can perhaps uh, talk about, I think if you're of a certain age, I think the process does get expedited. I don't know what that age cutoff is, though. All right. Um, how long does it take? Well, it depends on the art. And what that means is it depends on the su subject matter. Um, if it's something software related, well, okay, so what happens is in the um, USPTO, there are several art units, well, a whole bunch of them, and some are more backed up more than others. So depending on where, you know, whichever art unit, what you invent in is assigned to, it might take longer or shorter. So I've seen it 
you know, maybe less than a year, about a year, maybe about 13. Usually between, I've seen it before 18 months, and I know that for a fact because you get your first office action before the actual publication. They, publish, they publicize your um, actual patent 18 months after, unless you say you don't want to publicize it. Um, and it could take as long as, before you get your first service action, I've seen over three years. Uh, usually, if it's software related, it will take a long time. Anything software related would take just longer. And it would obviously cost a lot more to draft, a lot more to prosecute, because chances are you have that back and forth with the, um, the USPT or the examiners. Um, and Oh, the uh, age, the yeah. age is, I think it's six to five, yeah. and um, it has to do with, essentially, you don't have that much time left. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, but you, 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 have to, uh, you have to ask for it. Yeah, you have yeah. to ask for it, um, and also it could be on health grounds also, um, but you do have to ask for it, and then there are special, um, there, there are, I believe there are cost savings to yeah. it also, so. It's just something to ask for if you, you know, it would accelerate the entire process. Oh. And then there are other ways you could actually accelerate the entire process, but it costs a lot. You, you know, you're talking a lot of money, maybe 20K or something. So, so two things. It is, um, it's a strange discussion. We had to do this one on, on one of our patents, so we had to get our, a member of our board of director who had just gone through a stroke Mm -hmm. to say, we want to accelerate this one, so you know the rules, let's try to invent with you, and so, you know, the yellow-purple thing, and then we're gonna, we're gonna file, and it was like, I just had like a stroke, it's like, I know, but we want this one to go through quickly, so bear with us, Howard, he's still with us, thank God. Um, in other cases, you might not want to accelerate the prosecution. Uh, going back to the who is going to pay the bill at the end, are you fundraising, are you trying to sell the company and what have you. Um, so the, the prosecution time, your prosecution strategy, you should rarely handle it as a product. What do you show to whom, how do you write, even though the claims are important, if you're fundraising, you might want to claim in the description that you're solving well longer for you know, 20 cents a day type of a deal. So you th think about the time dimension um, uh, quickly, the stuff to realize, as it was just said, is the, the, there is a moment where your patent is secret. No one knows about it by going to the USPTO pair. And once it gets published, your competition knows what you're up to or thinks they know what you're up to. Um, so there are pre-publication and then post-publication. In some cases, you want it quickly. In other cases, you want it to drag and drag and drag and drag. Mm -hmm. So use it as a, as a, as a management tool. Um, I had the provisional patent for a year, as we yeah. talked about, and the actual patent took an additional three years. Yeah. Um, it wasn't a back and forth because when I first got my first notice, it was rejected on the claims. And I was like, because I had in my mind, say, four claims. And I thought, oh, I'll, I'll keep the fourth one out. I'll just put the three. And when it came back, they gave me, say, 90 days. And I said, forget it. I'm not going to worry about it. The day before the 90th day, the fourth claim that I had thought about originally, I put in, and it went straight through. Um, but that was a three-year process, and that was even bickering back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mine took probably, uh, it was about two years, almost two years to the day from when I submitted the patent to when I got the first office action. And it was actually fairly quick. I called the patent examiner. We talked about it, and, he, and basically mine was I... You have to anything you have in your claims. You have to have something in the specification that shows that. And so, mine. They said there was something in one of my claims that wasn't shown in the specification. I showed him where it was, and he said, "Well, if you just add like another three words onto this sentence, I'll prove it." And that was it. And it took probably another. That was in December, and then it um, it issued in March. So it was almost it was about two years and four months for me. But like Whale said, a lot of it just depends on what art units it's in there because. 90% of that time is sitting there waiting for somebody to look at it. Um, and you can, you can actually go on the Patent Office website and they'll show you little uh, metrics for each art unit of how much, how much the average time is for a, for a patent to get through. Um, international, that one's, a, that one's more long and drawn out because you want it to be because you're trying to extend the amount of time because of the expense. You want to extend it uh, pretty much as long as you can. 
Um, that one, but that one was really quick. That was the one I had to pay a lot of money for, but it came back like in four months because you're kind of sitting there waiting. Is my idea any good? Is it does it have a prayer of getting through? And that one came back in about four months from the European Patent Office. But I, with that one was four thousand dollars versus five hundred dollar filing fee in the U.S. So. <clears throat> By the way, one quick thing. Um, if you're a micro entity, in, in other words, a very small company, um, I, I know the, if you have, I believe, less than four patents and um, maybe make less than 160 k a year, and uh, I forgot what the third thing is. It, 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 but the bottom line being, you could actually file, the filing fees will be halved, the filing fees, not all the fees, but... So in other words, you could be paying, I believe it's 400 or something, either 350 or $400 um, to actually file a non-provisional patent. Um, that's just something to consider if you qualify for that. Great, so if you're a micro entity and you're over age 65, go ahead and start <laughs> filing your patents. <laughs> um, now I know with uh, my co-founders and I had a little bit of a dispute, and it's a dispute that I see happening in a lot of startup companies these days, and that is, that it's you know, when you're an early stage company, you're debating, okay, how much money do we need to set aside to get this provisional patent filed? And um, in the case of our provisional patent, by the way, um, we filed it and then we realized it was coming up on its one year time because you have one year before you have to file the full patent. And we weren't ready yet. We didn't have the funding yet to go to that phase. So what we did is we filed another provisional patent um, to reset the date so that we had another year to go. Um, and that's something I've seen as a strategy that some people have done over time. But a lot of questions that I often get is, uh, how detailed do those provisional patents need to be? I mean, how much information do you need to include? Um, here is the kicker. It needs to be as detailed as possible. Um, in other words, even if you can include the claims, go ahead. And the, the real reason being, most of the time, I would say, I don't really have the numbers, I'll just make it up. Maybe 80% of the time, nobody checks. Um, and what they're checking for is to see whether the non-provisional patent is, is actually supported by the provisional patents. But for the most part, nobody checks. Um, so they just take your data as is and everything is fine. Um, but if you were trying to sue someone, one of the, the, the very first strategies to try to invalidate your patent, um, that's the very first thing they do. So they look for any excuse whatsoever to say your patent is not valid. Um, so how much support do you need in the provisional patent? Whatever you can throw in, the kitchen sink, just throw it all in. It doesn't matter because nobody checks it. Well, until something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so just throw the kitchen sink at it, um, and hopefully in the future it, it has enough of what you need for support. Um, so usually with universities, or it's usually the research paper. You know, so somebody's going to um, give a, some sort of seminar or a speech on something they've been working on. Just file the paper itself, the, the, the paper, and that's it. Even slides. So the format doesn't really matter. Again, nobody checks it until they do. Uh, um, if you have an IP, I think the, the, the I think fundamental question is what do you spend money on? It's what entrepreneurship is all about, especially at the beginning. And, and even for established company, it should be a question. So part of it might be that you uh, uh, decide that you're going to have a very IP culture from the get-go. So a couple of tricks to, uh, I've been exposed over the years and adopted over the years. One is you get a, you know, if you're using Dropbox or equivalent, you get a file where every single element gets added and added and added. Um, you, tell, uh, you tell someone that goes to a sales call that says, I discussed three options with the customers. Option one was this, option two was this, option three was this. Says, I don't want to see a report with options. I want in one embodiment discussed, in another embodiment discussed, in a third embodiment discussed. You create this, um, you, you force everything to be captured in a manner that can be appended to this document, and you throw everything at it. Someone has done a search of what the competition is doing, says, we could you know, use this technique, this technique, and this technique, and curate these giant files. And I've seen, lit I mean, I filed provisional documents where there was 180 pages 
of blah, 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 and blah, 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 and more blahs. I'm French, so I can blah well. And 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 then just a couple of other claims that were utterly broad. Because what matters is a year from now, when you have to transform from the non-provisional to the provisional, you want to make sure that the stuff has cover. The other thing also, we would use Vistex, and let's say we find on Thursday that we're going to have a meeting with a big company on Monday. We're going to go under NDA, but what does an NDA really protect? Not that much. So you take the slides that you're going to present, staple them to the document, send them to your lawyer on Friday morning and say, please file that in the afternoon, so I want a little <laughs> certificate. So by the time it shows up on Monday is what we're going to talk about today is patent pending. And you, know, you, you just force yourself to, to, to create those elements. And it's just a matter of uh, always thinking how you're going to use what you've created over time to help yourself the patent process. And a you know, few, few little tricks help you to create this material that you can turn on a dime um, when needed to protect uh, yourself with respect to prosecution. Now, one additional expense besides the attorney um, would be if you had to get an uh, engineer to draw your graphs because yeah. you had to, as I said, submit pictures. Mm -hmm. I used Microsoft Word and did my graphs with that, and it worked, went fine. I just followed the regulations of what they said, how big um, the drawings had to be, and how extensive they had to uh, cross-reference the patent. But if you don't feel comfortable of using Microsoft Word, you would have to hire an engineer and have them to make blueprints, basically, and it has to be included in your non-professional patent application. Yeah. By the way, the drawings, um, those type of professionally drawn um, drawings, it, it doesn't have to be there immediately. So in other words, when you file in your patent, it, it could all be hand drawn. So what's going to happen is at some point during prosecution, you're going to get a rejection from the examiner saying yeah. they want to formalize the drawing. So essentially, you're buying time. But usually drawings, I don't know, maybe about $60, $80 a page. Mm -hmm. right, um, from uh, draftsmen, um, so they know the proper format. Um, it's not really CAD drawing, um, but it, it, so there's all the shadings and all this lines involved. No colors. No colors. Mm -hmm. But to file the first thing, just go ahead, throw it all in, and then worry about it later. Because those are one of the <laughs> things you can fix. Usually what you cannot fix later on is lack of information or lack of description of something that you cannot add later on because that's considered new matter. Um, but as long as you have a basis for whatever you're trying to add in the future, that's possible, which is why you throw the kitchen sink at it because you can always find something to draw from um, in the future because you don't know going in, you don't really know what might be valuable during prosecution, what the attorney or even yourself might need to make the claims allowable. So. Yeah, you actually might not get the whole patent that you originally filed. You might only get a portion of it or certain numbers of claims, correct? But, yeah. By the way, on the, on the patent culture thing, if you, if you feel comfortable, if you've, if you've got someone on your team that has done it and you feel comfortable with it, even when you're doing your internal presentations on PowerPoint, you know, box line, box line, box line, system design, and what have you, put some numbers on it, 1,001 in parenthesis and the little arrow and what have you. First of all, when you describe things over a video conference and you're talking about a software module or molecules, is which one? The 1,003 one. The second thing is you show that to uh, uh, a client and what have you, they're going to assume right away that this is part of a, of a patent thing, so it's already much more valuable. <laughs> um, and then, God forbid, that you have to do the staple on Friday morning for the Monday meeting, then you're already with things with numbers and descriptions. So if you know you're going to use it, start thinking in terms of these simple little modifications that allow you to have a very, very big kitchen sink. I mean, there's the kitchen sink. I think we should take the bathtub. I think the bathtub should be the model we go forward now, which is huge. Yes, right. Good, good. Great. Well, I know, I know there's often times where entrepreneurs, by the way, are speaking at events. For example, last week there was the uh, hatchery and the Bernstein competition. And when you're actually talking to either potential investors or you're talking just in general at pitch competitions, how much, how protective do you need to be with your IP in those early stages and discussions? You, you, but first of all, hatchery, I'm a huge fan. 
because mm -hmm. uh, we, we got uh, we got recognized years ago. Um, I think you have to apply the the, the one year rule, and always you're not under NDA. Um, someone might be able to connect the dots faster than you do, so you have to be very guarded. Um, once it's gone, it's gone. And uh, you know, patents uh, are very valuable. Um, the stuff to realize is very, very valuable if you've got a, a very bank account, big bank account and very strong lawyers behind you. So um, I think you have to be very careful, and unless this person has to know, then don't tell them. Um. I, I do second what he said because, so for the most part, you have to be very careful not to make sure you're not disclosing it. And also there are other things that might trigger a one-year clock, right? So in, if you offer to sell or something, so that would, that would um, essentially that would not make it possible to get the patent later on if you're not careful. A anyway, but the bottom line being, what do you disclose? Um, treat it like a some sort of military secret like need to know. And also even at that, be very careful like who you're talking to. And if what you might say to her should be different from what you might say to him if yeah, their him, backgrounds are different. He might not trust. Yeah. Right, be, be, because he, he might be able to, you might think, oh, you're being slightly evasive, but he can easily connect the dots, right? Like what he said, like, all you need was just to give him a clue as to what you're doing, and he figured it like, ah, that's it. But, but, and before you know it, it files a patent, um, you know. But even an, invest, an investor, if uh, uh, you have a savvy investor that says what you're doing and so on, and you start talking, the savvy investor will know that you have no, you're not going to protect his money that you want him to give into your company by disclosing the patent. So being shy about it, is in fact a good thing to say, well, I'd love to talk to you, but we can go under NDA. Even over NDA, I don't want to share and what have you. You're projecting that you care about what you have created a lot. Um, uh, we talk a lot about patents, and, uh, and by the way, on, on trademark, I totally rely on lawyers. I've yet to be I've been unable to get a trademark on my own, so on that one I defer to others. But uh, I've seen some cases, I mean, one of the trademark that, that we got, someone who says, hey, you know, your kitchen connected. Yeah, this is like you're connecting people to another. It's like having kitchen connected. And well, smile and what have you. And on the way back to, you know, to the office, they start going, has this been claimed or not? And claim it. And so the principal motto that we use for our early company, one of the important motto, was not even suggested by us. Someone brought that up. He said, oh, that would be nice. It's like, thank you very much for your insight. So always be careful. I already told you how paranoid I was. Um, I didn't yes. Mind, but Are you still married? <laughs> <laughs> but, but one thing uh, that uh, when I filed it, it was a um, you could have like an engineering notebook or something. You could keep you know you could keep records of, or you could show it to somebody. Even one trick was you could write your idea down, mail it to yourself, and then the postmark would prove that you know that that was your idea that date. Uh, but now the the way the U.S. is, it's first to file. So if, if I tell one of you guys in secret, you know, we go out in the hall and I tell you my invention, you can go home tonight and file a patent, file a provisional patent on the patent office website, and it's now your patent. I mean, unless I could somehow prove that, that, you, that you definitely got it from me, it's the, the U.S. is first to file. So that's another good reason to make sure you do NDAs and things like that for, uh, before you uh, disclose it to anybody. And mine was an actual product. So mine was a need-to-know basis. I worked three years um, before I even filed the actual paperwork. I would take it to the beach and pick out random people, and I would have them test my little sample product and ask recommendations. And that's how I fine-tune the product to see what the consumer would want. But again, you, you want to be limited to what you say, but yet you have to know what people want. So it's a fine line. Okay. I would agree, too. You can't really be too careful. and certainly coming in with an NDA or something like that gives you credibility and that sort of rapport. It, it makes that idea seem that much better, even if the person has no idea what you're talking about. Um, and from the, the trademark standpoint, uh, at least in our experience, it wasn't quite a first to file type thing. It was more you, you put the TM on your mark and I think we could date it back to 07 or something like that. My boss had written an article, it was published in a journal and he just made up this word and put a TM on it for fun. And then we were able to actually register it last year, and we had evidence that we used it a year before the company 
that was in Europe, and that actually helped us, I think, negotiate a little bit more, saying, okay, yeah, there's similar marks, totally different products, and we used it first. So in that case, you know, you can't, can't keep too many records and mail things to yourself, date everything. That's, that's a big help. And pictures. Pit, mm -hmm. Tons of pictures, yeah. dating them. <laughs> that's great. Good advice. All right, I want to make sure we have plenty of time to open it up to the audience for any questions. We've got microphones in the back of the room, um, so feel free to start lining up. Um, I know this gentleman here has a qu question he's been asking about. If you can talk really loud. I'm just staying seated okay. with this panel. Uh -huh. I have two inventions that you all use every, almost every day. One is a spell checker for German, Dutch, Italian, Spanish, French, Canadian, French, and you can Portuguese and Finnish. And the other is when you go to Lowe's or Home Depot or Target, you sign your name. I invented the writing, uh, the capture of the information and the storage and the regeneration and the, the adjustment. You, once you get in the computer, you can change the line colors and the thickness and everything. But also what I also want to say, when you are working every day, you may not be reporting anything, so get yourself a, a registered notebook that they were discussing. And maybe you can get a staples, I don't know. We have, I work for IBM. I work for Lockheed Martin. And, um, you know, the, the thing, but anyway, the registry in a book, as you're working every day, you may not, I didn't know I was building a spell checker for the world. I was just doing my daily work. Two of us, I'm Paul Grimm, 2M, Dave Clayton, we invented the spell checker, verifier, and then we have the corrector. We moved from two IBM people to 190 IBMers, because the IBM had to deploy it through all of their platforms, VM, MVS, uh, Series 1, AS400. They had, so they created a team, and we, they took our work and rolled it out. It took four years to get my patent and the patent of the team approved. So yes, three years, four years, one year. That was four years. Uh, we mm -hmm. didn't have to go through, we just answered questions. IBM had the attorney, so we didn't have to worry about what some of these uh, gentlemen and ladies had to worry about. Thank you all for being here, and thank uh -huh. you for hosting this. Sure. I appreciate it. Thanks. I could not even sit down. I, was, I had to get up and tell you about some of this. <laughs> but um, I already covered most of this. Reverse engineering. When we created the spell check, the attorneys came to us and said, how long is it going to take to revert? Somebody take your source code, not the source code, if you're all software engineers, you get object code at the bottom. All these programming languages creates assembly language. I coded the spell checker in Intel assembly language. I've 10 years of Intel assembly language. Now you'd rather smash your fingers than learn assembly language, but... That's for sure. But, <laughs> but, uh, somebody can take that object code and reverse engineer it. They take the instructions and they say, ah, they flip it back and they see what we're doing. So they want to know how long it would take for somebody to create a spell checker using our own code. And we said 18 months. It would take about 18 months to do that. So that was just our guess. We had no idea somebody could do it two months, which most likely happened. But, um, so there's a reverse engineering if you're doing software or if you built something, now, some people sit down and they say, I'm, I'm inventing something. I'm going to build something new. I don't exactly what I'm doing. But there are a lot of us, we just do our daily jobs, and we end up creating a shoe that goes worldwide or something. You know? So anyway, you have to keep records. That's, that's my point. I think that um, also what I like to do, I go to some of these things occasionally, and I walk away, and I see all these people who have interests, and I don't know why they were here. I don't know who they were. And I'm, I'm just totally lost. I walk out the door and I have nothing. So what I would like to see is a list of everybody here, why you're here, and what you expect. Would, for example, would you like to talk to me? Once I walk out the door, you're, you're not going to be able to get in touch with me, you know, or some of the other candidates. So uh, if we have a list of everybody, I know some people are a little touchy about that. But I want a list. I want to know why you're here. If you want to start, I want to start a company. I started a company. It's called Grandview Technology. And we're, the goal is to create 4,000 jobs. Now, create 4,000 jobs is like creating software university. You can't do that easily. You have to start with a small work call. Uh, but if any of you are interested in creating a company, 
using technology and creating jobs for this region or the United States, come talk to me. That's what we have common interests, and that's what we want to do. Now, uh, I'll go ahead and shut up. Thank I know you. we're getting short on time. Anyway. Yeah, but thank you very much for that information. I really appreciate it. And yeah. hopefully you'll stick around for a little bit if people have questions. I know our panelists and all of us will be sticking around too, but I want to get to as many questions as possible. I think there were a couple more hands. I was just yeah. say, as an engineer, I'd like to thank you profu profusely for inventing this belt checker. Yes, <laughs> yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I came to an intellectual property um, workshop mostly interested in copyright. Yeah. So I had a question for um, Professor Campbell. You said that in order to um, sue someone for copyright infringement, the copyright has to be registered. Yeah. Does it have to be registered before the infringer infringed, or does it just have to be registered before you file suit? There's no requirement that it be registered before the infringer starts infringing. You can file your registration after infringement starts. It just has to be registered before the lawsuit gets filed. But if you registered before infringement starts, then you're entitled to collect what are called statutory damages, where you don't have to prove how badly you were actually harmed by the infringement. Instead, there's this range of damages and the judge can just look at what happened and figure out what would be appropriate to compensate you. So you get this evidentiary um, benefit out of registering before infringement starts, but it's not required. As follow-up, um, how large does something have to be before it's covered by copyright? Um, for example, I, I wrote a textbook and I write copyright on it. I've never registered the copyright. Um, I use it here and I'm now putting it on a sharing platform um, called WebAssign. But I'm also programming individual problems that come from that textbook. So are the problems covered as well as the textbook or just the textbook? Do you know what I'm asking? I think I know what you're asking. So the problem is a, a short hypothetical, perhaps, that you've written. Math problem. Math problem. <laughs> Harder with math problems because... Yeah, some of them, it's like anybody could make this up and it's not really that original. But when you're doing it on an electronic platform, there's a lot of, well, how can I format this so that it can be automatically graded and all of the rest of that. Yeah, it's really difficult to say without seeing what you're talking about. I mean, yes, something small can be subject to copyright protection, but how thin that protection is, given the nature of the material, it's just really difficult to say in the hypothetical. And one last thing, how difficult is it to file to register a copyright? It's pretty simple. It's done online at the Copyright Office website. Um, they ask you a series of questions. Many of them are just contact information for the person filing or contact information for the author, those sorts of things. You have to upload a copy of whatever it is you created. So if it's a book, you upload an electronic copy of the text or you mail in a copy of the printed textbook. If it's a sculpture, you send them a photograph, those sorts of things. And the filing fees start at $55, so it's not expensive. Great. Thank you. Okay. Next question. <laughs> well, I'll just have a quick comment. I'm, I'm Karen Olmsted, so I'm the one that said to Neil Davis that, you know, I didn't, I was worried about intellectual property and my knowledge of it, um, and, and maybe in my colleagues too here. So I really appreciate um, all of your comments, and especially Professor uh, Campbell, your, your um, instruction. But I was just thinking, I'm a I'm the dean of the School of Science, I've been a biology professor for a long time. Um, it's not typical for us to include this type of education in our instruction. So if we're talking about, let's say, in a molecular biology course, molecular genetics course, we talk about the really cool technologies that are used, or in software engineering maybe, but we don't talk about as much the history of those ideas and how those ideas were protected and things like that. So I wondered if you knew of campuses that do a great job of integrating the concept of intellectual property protection 
in undergraduate education. Because um, Bur Bill Burke is over there. I've talked to him many times about their, uh, you know, the entrepreneurship contest and things like that. Do you know of things like that? Because I think that would be so valuable. Is he you know, hybrid through business schools and schools of science, or is it just totally a revolutionary interdisciplinary approach? I wonder if you're aware of those. I know at my uh, alma mater, MIT, uh, during the month of January, um, uh, something called Independent Activity Period, IAP, where those, cl those kind of classes are being put together, and they have a program called uh, VMS, which is a mentoring program, um, and I can, you know, give me a card, I can put you in touch with some of the folks putting that stuff together, um, uh, and they're starting to spice it more and more. Uh, of course, it's self-serving to a larger degree for them because they have a very strong licensing business, uh, you know, tech transfers and the like. But I know that MIT does that, and Stanford has a couple of. I've seen some online classes on iTunes U, so I would imagine that they've got things that can be looked around. A friend of mine teaches there, so I can ask him also to follow up. But I think it's I think it's very important, uh, more and more as you know, the, the economy morphs for for people to be aware. Um, and I think also to a certain degree, uh, especially after the movie The Social Network, um, uh, being an entrepreneur, it's what I tell my kids, you know, that they've not finished, the last one has not finished high school and made a billion dollars, so he's a total failure. But being an entrepreneur now um, is uh, almost being uh, the drummer of a rock group in the 70s. So the more we can entice kids to give up drums, <laughs> and start a business, uh, the better we all will be. So we'd like to try to help you connect. Good. And in the um, engineering school at the University of Maryland College Park, it's at the discretion of the individual professors, but a number of them now include at least a short IP component in their engineering courses. And in fact, sometimes I get invited to teach those. But it's becoming, um, there's an increasing awareness of the importance of IP, particularly when you have students working on capstone projects in engineering or the sciences where they're being encouraged to create something that could potentially be commercialized after they graduate. They need to understand the IP component. Good. Good. Next I have question. a uh, strong mic. I have an additive manufacturing hub I've been building, uh, collection of 3D printers for the intent of building parts for, uh, per, per order. And some of those parts could be potentially intellectual property, p p components of a machine. In manufacturing those parts and collecting a fee for those for that manufacturer, am I liable some way to violating intellectual property? Is this the no legal advice rule of the panel? It, it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> From the non-lawyer. Right. Welcome um, that plank. <laughs> So let me understand the question. So you're saying you do manufacture for third parties and... Yeah. So and in, a, in a sense, I can take any object and recreate it. Not even from the CAD file, I can just scan it and recreate it. One of the ideas I had was especially for <clears throat> recreating parts that are no longer available or too expensive or too, like foreign, or parts that you have to ship and cost. I could essentially have a get a copy of it, scan it, and reproduce it at a fraction of the cost. Am I in violation of something, possibly. Is, there, is, there, is it in the gray? Because I'm reading a lot about, uh, especially in the 3D, uh, 3D printing arena, there's a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, issues coming with people sharing, f sharing their uh, designs and then getting in trouble later, or issues happening with, with the sharing of that information. So I, I'm, just, I'm just curious because it's, uh, it's, I think there's a potential business in the re fixing things versus rebuilding them or getting buying new ones. So I, I'm just very interesting to hear your thoughts of uh, uh, potential liability. And I know it's not, not legal advice, but let's, let's play. Um. So I wish you had asked this question two weeks earlier because it would have been a great exam question for my past. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's great. It, it's a good question, and I would say with you know, everything in law, it depends. Uh, yeah. That's the cop-out. But it really depends, I believe, on whether or not the, um, whatever you're copying is actually protected. Um, so. It will be in a short period of time. I could take a phone. All right. 
scan it, swap the logo out with my own. Well, which is why I said it depends. Now, yeah. let's say, for example, um, the iPhone, there is this huge um, case, that, you know, that went on between um, Samsung and Apple as to how the phone looks. Yeah, around um, the rectangle. So that's a design patent. Yeah. So, which is why I said it depends. Now, if you, you, you know, duplicating parts from a 65 Camaro, chances are, again, chances are it, it is not protected. Definitely not with patents anyway, utility patents, um, and even design, because it, the time would have lapsed. Um, so I, I would say whatever you're doing, try to figure out if it's in the public domain or not. And but it's even worth yeah, my I time investing to look, because <laughs> I'm getting files from people that want me to print this. Well, I mean, you, you, you can, I mean, not, not a lawyer, um, uh, you, you can ask them to indemnify you, so they are, they are commercial constructs that help you to get protected and so on, but to kind of build on, on the case for the homework, I mean, you, this would be, uh, law in patents get ultimately done at the Supreme Court type of a deal, and I think you can have your name on something versus something else that resolve whether it's fair use to duplicate the valve of a, um, you know, mechanical heart replacement from Jarvid that was expired in 1978 for your aunt mm -hmm. and the boyfriend of your aunt and so on and so forth and pushing the envelope. I mean, you are, this is intersecting on so many areas, you know, digital, you know, the, the DMCA, copyright, fair use, you know, apart from an old widget that no longer exists. I mean, I've got, I've got uh, an old um, um, Apple displays and I've got seven power supplies because I know one of them die, you can't get the limit. Uh, you might be pushing the envelope a lot, but with respect to are you dealing with contract, you might also, not a lawyer, look into how a lawyer would help you with contract law to shield yourself. And maybe the shielding is not enough, but I think you're on the way to the Supreme Court case. This is good. Good. I would well, say too, go def ahead. definitely, not, definitely not, not a lawyer, but from, I'd also maybe look at it from a 3D printing by design, by the definitions, you're not like mass producing stuff, right? You're just, you're probably printing one, two at a time, is that right? The, the, yeah. yeah, at this time, right? But you know, like for my, for my product, if I was to find out that you 3D printed it for somebody, am I gonna go spend, you know, $50,000 to sue you because, you know, you sold, you, or you printed something for somebody? Probably mm -hmm. not, so. I would look at it from a, you know, how much volume are you doing? Is it just a one thing? You're just doing it one time for one person. It's probably unlikely that somebody would come after you for that. But yeah. Just my opinion. Good. Well, yeah. Great question. Go ahead. Yeah. Not as legal advice, but just as a hypothetical situation. The Uniform Commercial Code states that if someone provides you with specifications and says, "Build this for me." you aren't supposed to be liable for infringement for doing what they've told you to do. They're supposed to be liable, but not knowing your situation, I have no idea whether that applies. Okay. Well, listen, um, we're running short on time. These have been great questions, and I know you all probably have a lot more questions that are very specific to whatever you're working on right now. So I want to encourage everyone with those questions to come up, speak to our panelists one-on-one. -on -one. And before I close, I want to um, remind people that there's food and refreshments um, back in the back of the room, courtesy of Salisbury University. Also, I want to thank Salisbury University uh, for providing this fabulous facility for us to conduct this and all the hard work that went on with your staff staff and team. Um, Terry, thank you very much um, and the rest of everybody that was here to help as well. Um, and also thank our other sponsor, uh, the Maryland Intellectual Property Legal Resource Center. We appreciate Patricia's time here and also the time that uh, all these panelists took out of their day. A lot of them are not local, so some of them drove from pretty far to be able to be here to speak with you today. So definitely take advantage of that. And uh, also thanks to TEDCO as well. Um, so appreciate it. Hopefully we'll get to see you all again um, at another event at some time in the future. And we really appreciate you taking your time as well to learn more about intellectual property and go out and uh, protect yourself. Thank you. <laughs>